Hey, it's Sheila Social Studies. Hey guys, and welcome back to Sheila Social Studies. Today we're going to be talking about modern day civil rights movement and some of the court cases that were involved. We're going to start earlier in one of the earlier um, court cases, which is the Plessy versus Ferguson court case, to kind of set us up here. But then we're going to move into the more modern day, the 50s, the 60s of the 1900s, uh, the civil rights movement that gained steam with none other than people like Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Rosa Parks, uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, Malcolm X, people like that. So we're going to go ahead and start with the Supreme Court cases and civil rights movements. So in the 19th century, the United States went from being one unified country to a broken one because of the institution of slavery. The United States was not the only country in history to have the institution, but it was the only one to fight a civil war to keep it. Then for a brief period of 12 years between 1865 and 1877, a period known as Reconstruction, the government forced the South to accept the newly emancipated as African Americans gained the rights of freedom, citizenship, and suffrage rights. But on the back of one presidential election, the Northern Republicans betrayed millions of Southern African Americans, ending Reconstruction and allowing Jim Crow segregation to take full control of the South. Now, near the end of the 19th century, a very important court case reached the Supreme Court in the 1896 case of Plessy v. Ferguson. If you recall, Homer Plessy was the man who was one-eighth black but looked white and purchased a ticket for the whites-only train in New Orleans, which was against the law. He was arrested and took his case all the way to the Supreme Court, the place where the majority of the civil rights movements take shape. As a result of Plessy's case, the Supreme Court established the separate but equal doctrine reinforcing Jim Crow laws allowing segregation as long as the separate, uh, separate facilities were equal. The problem was that in reality, the facilities were always separate but never equal. The Supreme Court decision would lead to almost a century of two different Americas, one that is white and another that is colored. We are now going to enter the 20th century, which for those of you that don't know, that is the 1900s. And throughout the early 1900s, and where we will begin discussing other Supreme Court cases in the mid-1900s, it should not come to a shock to you that the South held up the part of the law that stated that schools were meant to be separate. Their failure was to follow the part that said that they needed to be equal. Schools located in the South were far from equal. Schools that were set aside for black children were often left over from the time of Reconstruction. Problems with colored schools included, but were not limited to, the buildings falling apart, desks and chairs that were made of old wood, roofs were leaking, supplies like books were lacking, and teachers were underpaid. State funding for colored schools in the South was almost non-existent, while funds for white schools flowed like liquid gold. Typically, the white schools were funded 10 to 20 times more than colored schools in the South. Looking at pictures from that time period, white schools had pictures hanging on the walls, Desks that looked new. Some classes had comfy chairs, bookcases full of books, solid construction, and soft carpeted floors. And oh yes, teachers were also paid more in white schools than schools that usually had sports teams as well. An example of this divide in schools come from, comes from the story of Little Rock Central High School and Paul Lawrence Dunbar High Schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. The Little Rock School Board of Education allocated $1.5 million to build the white school, Little Rock Central High School, and allocated $0 for the colored school. One of the school board members had to go and petition for grants and donations to build a high school for the colored students. The list of differences of the schools were tremendous. The first point of attack was ending segregation in public schools, and leading this attack was members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. 
the attorney for the NAACP and future Supreme Court justice that led the battles against school segregation was Thurgood Marshall, who argued that the separate but equal clause was violated and that separate schools did not provide equal educational opportunities for black students. The Supreme Court would finally make a decision on May 17, 1954, in the case of Brown v. Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. Linda Brown was a seven-year-old African-American girl from Topeka, Kansas, who attended a segregated school that was over one mile from her house when there was another school only six blocks from her home. Linda's parents requested for her to be enrolled in the closer school but was denied because of her race. Her father and the NAACP sued to allow Linda to attend a school that was closer to home. By the time the case was decided, it wouldn't affect Linda, but it would go on to affect the whole United States. Chief Justice Earl Warren fought hard to achieve a unanimous decision of 9 to 0 that segregation in public schools was illegal. He wanted to be sure that there would be no sign of hope for anyone who may want to fight this decision in court. In 1955, courts around the United States ordered public schools to desegregate. The only problem was that they never told them when they had to do it. Years after the Supreme Court's decision, only about 10% of schools in the South were compliant with the order, while other schools in the South decided not to comply at all. Even today, there are still schools in the United States that are segregated among the races. So you remember the Little Rock Central High School from before? We're about to discuss it again. Some states implemented a gradual plan of integration. The word integration means the combining or desegregating of something like schools. In 1957, the school board in Little Rock decided to start integrating one high school, Little Rock Central. The school board forced the integration of the high school to follow the law. To figure out who was going to be the students, there was a series of interviews and criteria that needed to be met. The request was sent out to African American population in Little Rock for volunteers to integrate the high school. There was a hesitation because of the possible repercussions that would be felt sending a handful of colored students into a huge white segregated school. After a round of interviews, the original number of volunteers numbered around 200, and that was whittled down to nearly 80. And after a list of criteria like perfect attendance and perfect grades, the list was shrunk down to a few handfuls. As an attempt to dissuade parents from sending their children to the school, the county suggested congratulating them by printing their names in the paper for all, including the white supremacists, to see. The number settled on was nine. These nine outstanding, well-qualified black students would attempt to desegregate the famed Little Rock Central High School. On the day that desegregation was to begin, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus ordered troops from the National Guard to prevent the students from entering the high school. The nine students... Melba Patillo, Ernest Green, Elizabeth Eckford, Minnie Jean Brown, Terrence Roberts, Carlotta Walls, Jefferson Thomas, Gloria Ray, and Thelma Mothershed were about to embark on some of the most troubling days ahead. Upon arrival at the school, white students and an angry mob shouted at, threw items at, and spit on the students as they attempted to walk by, ultimately failing to attend a class on the first day. President Eisenhower responded by sending federal troops from the 101st Airborne to escort the students into the school, and in late September, the Little Rock Nine began to attend classes. Stories that come out of the next few years of what those brave students had to go through are not to be understated. The girls said that they were spit on so much that they had to wring out their dresses when they got home. They were screamed at, hit with locks, had their hairs pulled, and threatened, among other things, on a daily basis. The boys were hit, screamed at, jumped, threatened, and forced to walk barefoot on glass in the locker room showers, among other things, not necessarily on a daily basis, 
but most of that stuff was on a daily basis. If any of the nine fought back at any point in time, they would be immediately suspended or expelled, while the white students received barely no punishment. When the federal troops were asked why they did not intervene, they stated that they were there just to make sure that nobody was killed. Governor Faubus was also attempted to stop desegregation by closing the high schools in the school district for a whole year, allowing white students to attend private schools for their credit. This effort was again thwarted by President Eisenhower, ordering the schools reopen the next year. At the end of their journey, eight of the nine students graduated. Only one, Minnie Jean Brown, fought back and was expelled. She dumped chili on somebody, and she called somebody white trash. That's why she was expelled. The fight for equal educational opportunities has begun. So along with segregation in public schools, separation of the races was happening in public places and public transportation as well. African American passengers were required to sit at the back of city buses and forced to give up their seats to white passengers as the bus got full. Another issue that African Americans were facing when entering the bus was that in many cases they were not allowed to pass the white passengers to get to their seats. Many times a colored passenger would enter the front of the bus pay their fare, and they would exit the front of the bus and walk to the back entrance and get back through there, many times with the driver just pulling away, taking the money, and leaving the person behind. The Montgomery chapter of the NAACP was up for the challenge. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks, the secretary of the Montgomery, Alabama chapter of the NAACP, while riding home from work, refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white passenger. Park said she was tired, not tired of the day's work that she had just experienced, but tired of being segregated. The bus driver immediately stopped the bus, called the police, and Parks was arrested. Rosa Parks was chosen for many reasons. The NAACP understood that an image was everything. If they were able to show a 40-something-year-old woman who was a lighter complexion than others, they may gain more coverage for their cause. Parks was fined $10 for her brave act, and the fight for equal rights raged on. Immediately after Parks' arrest, local leaders began to organize the Montgomery bus boycott. Word got around for the African American population of Montgomery to boycott the public transportation system on the day of Parks' trial. Leaders hoped that they would get up to 50% participation from the community, and in reality, they were supported by over 90%. Thousands of African Americans in the city stopped riding buses altogether as they began to ride share and find other ways like walking and riding their bikes to arrive at destinations. The boycott lasted 381 days. The public transportation system started to suffer economically because it relied on the huge numbers of African Americans riding the transit system. During the boycott, city officials tried many ways to sabotage its success by arresting King, police brutality, and house bombings, including King's. Finally, in 1956, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation on public transportation was illegal. Now, leading the Montgomery bus boycott was 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. King was a young Baptist minister who was new in town and offered the basement of his Baptist church to the NAACP to organize the boycott. This was fate. Even though King believed that fighting for civil rights, it was not his plan to become the pariah of it all. When King was talking to Rosa Parks and others, they were able to talk King into leading the charge. Why? They told him that he was a new in town and he didn't have such a wide following. He also had a calm demeanor and other ministers wanted nothing to do with the movement that he would be their leader. What a stroke of luck. King was the perfect man for the job. He believed the boycott would work because he believed in peaceful protesting. He studied the writings and practices of Gandhi, who advocated for civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance to social injustice. But this was only the beginning for Martin Luther King Jr. because after the success of the bus boycott, protests and fights spread across the South with other African Americans began to fight for rights in all aspects of society. 
King would go on to form the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which believed that civil rights were essential to democracy and helped organize many of the peaceful protests that were about to come. The civil rights movement was taking form. Another type was the sit-in movement. Successful civil rights movements were spanning the South. Attention was beginning to shine on all areas of segregation in the South, and so far it was the adults were at the forefront of it all. That was until the sit-in movement was born. Private businesses across the South were still legally segregated, uh, including restaurants and stores. Four college students from Greensboro, North Carolina, who attended North Carolina A&T, Ezel Blair Jr., David Richmond, Franklin McCain, and Joseph McNeil were about to make history. These men wondered why at the local store named Woolworths, they were able to shop in the store, pick up any item that they wanted, go to the cash register and pay, but when they wanted to drink a coffee at the lunch counter, they were denied. So the four men hatched a plan that they would sit at the counter and not order anything to protest the law. After all, there was no law in place about sitting at the counter. So on February 1st, 1960, the Greensboro Four entered Woolworth's store in Greensboro and staged a sit-in protest where they sat at the stools for whites-only section of the counter and refused to leave. White patrons were outraged and the police were called, but could only do so much because the law was not being broken. The store closed for the evening. The next morning, the four young men returned with dozens more students and recreated their sit-in protest. White Southerners and police harassed the protesters throughout the whole day. They would be punched and kicked. They would have salt, ketchup, and malt poured all, uh, poured all on their head. And when the pain became too much, they would ball up on the floor and take the punishment while another student took their place at the counter. The fight against segregation in public places was growing rapidly as day by day, more and more students throughout the South staged sit-ins at other retail establishments forcing some businesses to begin the process of integration. College students across the nation started to become a force to be reckoned with. African Americans and whites united in causes to support the new younger generation of protesters. Martin Luther King Jr. was keen to the power of the younger generation and in 1960 sponsored a conference to discuss new strategies. Leaders of the student protests, white and colored alike, came together to form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. SNCC would train willing protesters in the art of peaceful protesting. Their training included not to react to being spit on, harassed, having smoke blown in their face, or physically attacked. Early leaders like Bob Moses, Stokely Carmichael, and Fannie Lou Hamer organized civil rights demonstrations all over the South. Moses would help form the Council of Federated Organizations that would include a coalition of the major civil rights movement organizations operating in Mississippi that included SNCC, the NAACP, and the Congress on Racial Equality. A group of students from the North, led by James Farmer, that supported grassroots efforts, began to protest in the South. All right, guys, we'll see you next time.